Good day everyone, Dr. Polaris here. After the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous, mammals underwent an explosive period of diversification. With the non-avian dinosaurs out of the way, our furry relatives expanded into many new niches, including that of large herbivores. One of the earliest examples of this trend were the pantodonts. First appearing less than a million years after the KPG extinction event, these unusual animals were initially small and omnivorous, with most being no larger than squirrels. However, as the Paleocene progressed, they grew rapidly in size. Indeed, by the end of the period, genera such as Barry Lambda and Corypodon weighed as much as 700 kilograms, that is 1,500 pounds, and were dedicated herbivores. The group was native to Eurasia, North America, and even South America, and it has been suggested that pantodonts first originated in the early Paleocene of Asia, given that most of the basal forms have been found there. These animals were successful and fairly diverse herbivores during the Paleocene and early Eocene, with some species being dog-sized and arboreal, while others were heavily built ground sloth-like creatures, or were hippo-like and semi-aquatic. After their initial success, the pantodonts declined during the later Eocene, probably due to increased competition with more derived ungulates. By the end of the period, only the large genus Hypercorypodon was still present in the swampy forests of Mongolia. As with many other early Cenozoic mammal radiations, the pantodonts perished during the end Eocene extinction event, unable to adapt to the drying conditions. Just where the pantodonts fit on the mammal evolutionary tree has been long debated. Since the 1990s, the group has been regarded as close relatives of the similarly unusual Tilodonts, and part of a radiation of non-placental eutherians known as Chimolestans. These mammals are known from the late Cretaceous, especially the genus Chimolestes itself, an adaptable rat-sized animal. It was theorised that pantodonts and their relatives evolved from forms like this, exploiting the ecological vacuum left by the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. This would mean that pantodonts were not closely related to any living mammal group. However, more recent studies have suggested a link with the periptychids, a group of stem ungulates also from the Paleocene. This would make pantodonts a part of Laurasiotheria, being one of the earliest forerunners of modern even-toed and odd-toed ungulates, while not being direct ancestors of them. Honestly, the taxonomy of early ungulates, often referred to as condyloths, is an absolute mess, but I'll explain that situation further in a future video. During the early Paleocene, these animals thrived and radiated quickly. Among the oldest and most basal pantodonts were members of the family Bema Lambdidae, which contained the genera Hypsilo Lambda and Bema Lambda. Both lived in China until the Middle Paleocene. Hypsilo Lambda is known only from a skull and teeth but Bema lambda is known from complete cranial and postcranial specimens, and was the best preserved mammal from its type locality. It was dog-sized, which was rather large for the time, and omnivorous. The skull was low, sturdy, and contained a very small brain case, along with a pronounced sagittal crest, indicative of strong chewing ability. The limbs and postcranial skeleton were robust, and seemed to have been adapted for digging. In life, Bema Lambda would have resembled a small, long-tailed bear in appearance. Also living in Paleocene China was the genus Harpiodus, which was much smaller, about the size of a large rat. This animal was also omnivorous and was probably capable of climbing trees. Interestingly, another basal pantodont has been recovered from the early Paleocene of Bolivia. This was the small, squirrel-like Alcididorbinia, an animal that weighed a mere 500 grams. The genus is one of the oldest and most primitive of the pantodonts, and the only species known from South America. Known from decent remains, which include postcranial elements, which indicates that it was a moderately sized, plantigrade, generalized terrestrial animal with good climbing ability, and occasionally was capable of standing in a bipedal position. The scutiform ungual phalanges were probably bearing nail-like hooves or primate-like nails, and because of the absence of claws, fossorial habits are unlikely. More derived pantodonts appeared in North America during the Middle Paleocene. An example of this was Pantolambda, 
a terrestrial herbivore found in New Mexico, Wyoming, and Montana until 57 million years ago. It was large for a Paleocene mammal, about the size of a sheep, a generalised early pantodont. It had a vaguely cat-like body, heavy head, long tail, and five-toed plantigrade feet, ending in blunt nails that were neither hooves nor sharp claws. The foot bones articulated in a similar way to those of hoofed mammals, and the feet were probably not very flexible. The teeth had a selenodont structure, which were enamel ridges with crescent-shaped cusps. Selenodont teeth are found in modern grazers and browsers such as cattle and deer, but Pantolambda's teeth were low-crowned and indicate a not very specialised diet. It probably ate a mix of shoots, leaves, fungi and fruit, and may have supplemented its diet with occasional worms or eggs. From sheep-sized Pantolambda-like ancestors came the much larger Barry Lambdids, which contained four genera of bulky herbivorous animals. Of these, the genus Barry Lambda is by far the best known. Measuring up to 2.5 metres long and weighing up to 700 kilograms, the animal was comparable in size to a large bear. In life, Barry Lambda probably resembled a large ground sloth, with a small head and long, well-developed tail, while walking on heavy, five-toed plantigrade feet. During the late Paleocene of North America, Barry Lambda was one of the largest mammals around, and its sheer size would have served as a deterrent to predators. The vertebrae of the tail were unusually massive. The living animal may have been able to rear up and support itself on its hind legs in order to reach higher food. The generalised appearance of the teeth, the presence of well-developed canines only in males, the grinding wear and lack of shearing blades on the molars, and the animal's heavy build strongly suggest that it was herbivorous. The creature likely lived a similar life to that of a modern tapir, browsing on foliage and soft vegetation. Barry Lambda seems to have been quite successful for an early pantodont, living for approximately 10 million years before being outcompeted by more derived pantodonts during the Eocene. A somewhat close relative, Titanoides, was also present in late Paleocene North America. This bulky animal was smaller than its cousin, being about 1.5 metres long on average and weighing roughly 200 kilograms. Titanoides was very bear-like, being a short-tailed, heavy-set beast with stout limbs. The animals possessed large canines, which were likely used in territorial disputes or in mating displays. Their feet were clawed, unlike those of other derived pantodonts, which may have been an adaptation to digging for roots and tubers. Titanoides was the largest mammal that inhabited North Dakota 60 million years ago, when the region was covered in subtropical swampland. The main predators at the time were crocodiles, and it is possible that Titanoides sometimes fell prey to these reptiles. As a whole, during the Paleocene, North American pantodonts were larger than their Asian relatives, most of which were dog-sized and comparatively slender in build. Among the largest and most derived of the pantodonts were members of Corypodontidae. They were native to Eurasia and North America from the late Paleocene to the late Eocene, and were the latest surviving of all pantodonts. In form, they were bulky, hippo-like animals, with prominent canines, short tails, and massive heavy skulls. The most basal of these was Corypodon, which was most common in North America, but also inhabited Europe and Asia. At about 1 metre tall at the shoulder and 2.5 metres in body length, Corypodon is one of the largest known mammals of its time. The creature was very slow moving, with long upper limbs and short lower limbs, which were needed to support its weight. Corypodon does not seem to have had many predators, as its large size and formidable canine teeth would have made attacking the animal a daunting prospect. It had one of the smallest brain-to-body ratios of any mammal, living or extinct, possessing a brain weighing just 90 grams, or 3 ounces, and a body weight of around 500 kilos. Corypodon had a semi-aquatic lifestyle, living in swamps and marshes like a hippopotamus, although it was not closely related to modern hippos or to any animal known today. Corypodon had very strong neck muscles and short tusks that were probably used to uproot swamp plants. The other teeth in the mouth were suited for processing plant material that had been grabbed by browsing. Fossils found on Ellesmere Island, near Greenland, 
show that Corypheidon once lived in the warm swamp forests there, with huge trees similar to the modern cypress swamps of the American South. Though the climate of the Eocene was much warmer than today, plants and animals living north of the Arctic Circle still experience months of complete darkness and 24-hour summer days. Isotopic studies of tooth enamel revealed that during the summer period of extended daylight, Corypheidon would eat soft vegetation such as flowering plants, aquatic plants and leaves. However, during the extended periods of darkness, when plant photosynthesis was impossible, Corypheidon would switch to a diet of leaf litter, twigs, evergreen needles, and most revealingly, fungi, an organism and food source that does not require light to grow. Not only does this study reveal the dietary range of Corypheidon, but it also reveals the behaviour of the northern populations living within the Arctic Circle. In this respect, Corypheidon did not migrate south or hibernate, it simply switched between two seasonal food sources. A descendant of this adaptable animal was the even larger Hypercorypheidon, the latest surviving pantodont. Native to Mongolia until the late Eocene, it was very similar to its ancestor, being a hippo-like browser and inhabitant of wet subtropical forests. Hypercorypheidon was about the size of a modern Sumatran rhino, weighing up to 700 kilograms and maybe lived a somewhat similar lifestyle. When environmental conditions changed at the end of the Eocene, the swampy forests favoured by the pantodonts began to be replaced with more open woodland, and this spelled the end for this pioneering lineage of herbivorous mammals. Despite being very generalised and primitive in form when compared to the ungulates alive today, the pantodonts were among the earliest large herbivorous mammals and were successful in their own time, producing species that range from squirrel-like to ground sloth-like and even hippo-like. This makes them a worthy subject of attention in the paleo community, and it is a shame that they are not discussed more frequently, a fate that is shared by numerous early Cenozoic mammal lineages. Thanks for watching everyone. Next week I'll be covering the Erythrosuchids and their relatives. See you again soon. Cheerio.